This is Robert McCormick, NBC News, Washington. NBC Radio presents President Kennedy making his first State of the Union message in person to a joint session of Congress. Members of the Cabinet have just entered the chamber. Mrs. Kennedy is sitting in a special box overlooking the podium from which the President will speak. Mr. Kennedy will be introduced by William Fishbait Miller, doorkeeper of the House. Speaker Rayburn and Vice President Johnson have taken their positions behind the podium in high back chairs behind the podium from which the President makes his address. Mr. Kennedy's speech will be quite short, some 4,500 words. In it, the President will outline his views on general problems facing this nation. If he follows his usual policy, he will be blunt about condi conditions, both domestic and foreign. The joint session is, of course, well attended. As a matter of fact, every seat in the chamber seems to be taken. And now, here is Fishbait Miller. Members of the Congress, I have the great pleasure, the high privilege, and the distinguished honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Vice President, members of the Congress, it is a pleasure to return from whence I came. You are among my oldest friends in Washington, and this house is my oldest home. It was here, it was here more than 14 years ago that I first took the oath of federal office. It was here for 14 years that I gained both knowledge and inspiration from members of both parties in both houses, from your wise and generous leaders, and from the pronouncements which I can vividly recall, sitting where you now sit, including the programs of two great presidents, the undimmed eloquence of Churchill, the soaring idealism of Nero, the steadfast words of General de Gaulle. To speak from this same historic rostrum is a sobering experience. To be back among so many friends is a happy one. I am confident that that friendship will continue. Our Constitution wisely assigns both joint and separate roles to each branch of the government. And a President and a Congress who hold each other in mutual respect will neither permit nor attempt any trespass. For my part, I shall withhold from neither the Congress nor the people any fact or report, past, present, or future, which is necessary for an informed judgment of our conduct and hazards. I shall neither shift the burden of executive decisions to the Congress nor avoid responsibility for the outcome of those decisions. I speak today in an hour of national peril and national opportunity. Before my term has ended, we shall have to test anew whether a nation organ organized and governed such as ours can endure. The outcome is by no means certain. The answers are by no means clear. All of us together, this administration, this Congress, this nation, must forge those answers. But today, were I to offer, after little more than a week in office, detailed legislation to remedy every national ill, the Congress would rightly wonder whether the desire for speed had replaced the duty of responsibility. My remarks, therefore, will be limited, but they will also be candid. To state the facts frankly, 
is not to despair the future nor indict the past. The prudent heir takes careful inventory of his legacies and gives a faithful accounting to those whom he owes an obligation of trust. And while the occasion does not call for another recital of our blessings and assets, we do have no greater asset than the willingness of a free and determined people through its elected officials to face all problems frankly and meet all dangers free from panic or fear. The present state of our economy is disturbing. We take office in the wake of seven months of recession, three and one half years of slack, seven years of diminished economic growth, and nine years of falling farm income. Business bankruptcies have reached their highest level since the Great Depression. Since 1951, farm income has been squeezed down by 25%. Save for a brief period in 1958, insured unemployment is at the highest peak in our history. Of some five and one half million Americans who are without jobs, more than one million have been searching for work for more than four months. And during each month, some 150,000 workers are exhausting their already meager jobless benefit rights. Nearly one-eighth of those who are without jobs live almost without hope in nearly 100 specially distressed and troubled areas. The rest include new school graduates, unable to use their talents, farmers forced to give up their part-time jobs which help balance their family budgets, skilled and unskilled workers laid off in such important industries as metals, machinery, automobiles, and apparel. Our recovery from the 1958 recession, moreover, was anemic and incomplete. Our gross national product never regained its full potential. Unemployment never returned to normal levels. Maximum use of our national industrial capacity was never fully restored. In short, the American economy is in trouble. The most resourceful industrialized country on earth ranks among the last in the rate of economic growth. Since last spring, our economic growth rate has actually declined. Business investment is in a decline. Profits have fallen below predicted levels. Construction is off. A million unsold automobiles are in inventory. Fewer people are working. And the average work week has shrunk well below 40 hours. Yet prices have continued to rise so that now too many Americans have less to spend for items that cost more to buy. Economic prophecy is at best an uncertain art. As demonstrated by the prediction one year ago from this same podium that 1960 would be, and I quote, the most prosperous year in our history, unquote. Nevertheless, forecasts of continued slack and only slightly reduced unemployment through 1961 and 1962 have been made with alarming unanimity, and this administration does not intend to stand helplessly by.